You are listening to Service Course by The Cycling Podcast. I don't talk to a program where they don't ask about other bikes to do other events. So if I'm talking to a road team, a women's road team, they all ask me about how do I also supply cyclocross and gravel bikes for my riders. With Lizzie Banks and Tom Wally. Lizzie, uh, good to see you. Uh, For the first time ever on this podcast, we're not actually together. No, well, I'm by a crackling fire and I'm pretty much in the Peak District. But but Tom (laughs) decided today that the weather was too bad uh, and he didn't want to ride. So the first time today we're doing a remote recording from our homes. I think, I mean, this morning, to be fair, it was hammering it down with snow and I didn't fancy going over Snake Pass twice. I, I mean, to be fair, over this winter, I have gone soft, Blizzy. I've been mostly on the turbo. So um, maybe, I've, yeah, maybe I'm just a bit scared of going out on the road in, uh, these days. I don't know what it is. I think I'm, being, I think I'm being a little bit hard on you because at the time that we would have been leaving, <laughs> I did look out the window and it was snowing. So, yeah, I, it's fair enough. But you would have had a tailwind. Well, I do live on the colder side of the uh, Pennines, though. <sighs> excuses, excuses, Tom. <laughs> um, so, Lizzie, uh, what are we doing in this episode? So this month, we're looking a bit at the ins and outs of the 2020 Peloton. And we're really focusing on riders that have stepped up from a domestic to a Conti level or Conti to, to World Tour. Um, and we're looking at their experiences of what it's like to, to change teams, to change equipment, change pedals, um, experience all these new things like nutrition, health tests, um, bike fits. And yeah, just just look at the challenges that they face in moving teams and how they adapt to life in the new teams. I found that stuff really interesting. But the first piece we're going to do, and this came about from just an observation from you when we were looking at when we were looking at the the kit and the tech that people are riding this year. Um, you pointed out to me that Cannondale particularly had uh, really increased their um, visibility in the women's peloton. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed that. This year, they're sponsoring Drops, the British team, Valcar, the Italian team, and Tibco Silicon Valley Bank, the the women's American team. And in the men's world tour, as we all know, they've got EF Education first. And I really wondered, why is it that they've got three women's teams? Was it just an accident or is there a reason behind it? Well, I spoke to Jonathan Guerin, the Global Director of Sports Marketing at Cannondale, and I asked him what it's like supporting three different women's teams. Sometimes that strategy is a good strategy, and we have a nice plan around it this year. Sometimes having too many programs it can also not be the best strategy. Um, you know, but these programs, one of the things that's so exciting about women's racing, you know, is that these women and how um, dedicated to the support they are in that, yes, they train at as professional athletes, but outside of the sport, a lot of them carry higher level educations and including postgraduate degrees and do work outside of cycling as well, just to be able to ride bikes as a professional athlete. So um, it's really inspiring stories to be a part of, which is why, you know, with Drops and Tipco um, and Valcar, we we really excited to be partnered with these teams just because of the stories we think we can tell around these athletes. So I was interested to know whether it was deliberate on the part of Cannondale to expand its support of women's teams or whether it was just a happy accident. It's not an accident at all. Um, And in fact, um, going back to world championships in Richmond, Virginia. um, So what is that now? Four years ago this year, right? Um, You know, we only had uh, a limited showing in the women's field and particularly in the amateur ranks for Cannondale Bicycles at that at that race while we were quite heavily represented in the men's field um and we had always sponsored high level kona level triathletes we always sponsored um cannondale cyclocross world.com that had uh 50 balance of females on the elite roster and two or three females on the development roster depending on the year um so we had always and then on the mountain bike side we had always supported like the stands women's elite team Um, and we've had, uh, female athletes on the Cannondale factory racing program. We've always supported very high level female athletes across the disciplines. It just felt like, uh, you know, we were maybe absent from one key discipline that was a bringing quite exciting racing to, um, that audience 
and two, um, really deserve that high level support that the male programs get as well. So Lizzie, how does it work with your um, equipment sponsors? Are, are you constantly feeding back to them in order to find ways to improve their products? Yeah, definitely. We, With our bike sponsor, Chapter 2, we had some things where we talked to them about how they could improve the seat post clamp, for instance. Um, and this year we've got uh, a new sponsor, a new title sponsor and a new kit sponsor with Katusha. And they joined us on camp. And what was really eye-opening eye for me was how much they want us to test the products feedback and they really want to make the products the best they possibly can be and they're using us as a test team because we ride this stuff all the time we spend half our life in this kit and we know exactly what yes what we need to do our jobs well and to be the best professional athletes we can be but we also know what other people want to feel comfortable to look good um, to keep warm in winter things like having a longer cuff on a sleeve things like um, having grips on gloves you know so all these little bits of feedback just things like uh having a cuff on the top of a zip so it doesn't rub your neck all these little bits of feedback we give back to our sponsors and it's not just for kit it's for tires as well we tell them how they feel it's for wheels everything and it enables um, the manufacturers to make the best products they can not only for the professional athletes but mostly for the public out there who are actually buying these things well, I wanted to learn more about this from Jonathan and I wondered whether it was too early to tell yet whether working with three women's teams would influence future designs. No, it, it's, it's not too early to tell. And in fact, um, at most of the team camps we send, we have a PhD aerodynamicist, a guy named Nathan Berry, um, who helped us develop the System 6 as the fastest bike in the world. And then he, he updated the, the new generation, the current generation Evo, with his aerodynamic experience and balancing what the Evo style riding bike is for a, a, a road stage or a mountain stage and things along those lines. But in talking with him and his design aesthetic and his um, aerodynamic uh, concerns and performance concerns, he goes to the women's team camps with us. He explains to them the science behind the bikes. And you have to, you have to consider... Um, you know, how a female sits on a bike, how a female races a bike in conjunction with how a male sits on a bike and how a male races a bike, um, both at the elite level and then down through the amateur ranks as well. Because ultimately, as a bike manufacturer, we're here to provide a better riding experience to the amateur rank, uh, amateur ranks of cyclists that are um, that are engaging with the sport through their local retailer and stuff along those lines. And that feedback, whether it's saddle position, handlebar position, um, stack and reach, uh, com frame compliance all comes back to our engineering team from a variety of sources and factored into our evolutions and our bike designs going forward. Um, and, and for sure that story for us wouldn't be as true of a story if we are not supporting women's teams that are racing in the best races in the world. Well, we'll hear more from Jonathan later in the episode. Um, he's got some particularly interesting things to say on the future of working with professional teams and the sort of things that riders want that have, that's changed a lot over the years. Um, but now I wanted to talk to uh, a few riders who have changed teams, who've stepped up from the amateur ranks to, to turn in pro um, because it's a, it's a big change. I mean, you've just come from your, your team training camp um, what was earlier this month and I, I've been at a team training camp and it's, it's, incredible to see the amount of equipment that you're briefed on and that you're given and you're presented with at team camp. I mean, for, I mean, for instance, your last camp, what were you given? So we already had all of our bikes. Um, well, the riders who were in the team last year already had all their bikes set up and obviously all the measurements were set up and it was a few people had tweaked a few things. So I got a, I had a new pair of shoes over the winter. So I'd actually tweaked my saddle position. So then I brought you know, I just brought my seat post and said, please replicate this. Um, and I brought all of my TT equipment, my armrests. Again, my seat post said, please replicate this on my race bike and my training bike. But for the new riders, obviously, it's kind of getting used to all of that setup, getting used to the different feel of different wheels, different tires, um, different components, different size handlebars. Um, but we also received all of our kit. And I think kit 
uh, is a really big thing because it's so important in so many races to be the right temperature. If you go into a classics race and it's throwing it down and you're not wearing the right clothing, you're not going to do well in the race. When Anna van der Breggen won Strada a couple of years ago, she said that she was basically just the warmest person out there. It was an absolutely freezing day out there and she had the right clothing. She kept drinking tea. She kept drinking warm. So having all this kit, you have to get to know the kit. You have to know what kit you need for different scenarios. And um, yeah, so it's just kind of getting accustomed to, to everything that you're using, all the different tech, the new different nutrition products. Some people like gels, some people like mix, some people like water. Um, but if you don't take the right products, then it can really screw up your day in a race. Well, let's hear from a couple of women who've moved teams over the winter. Are they both sort of stepped up? Is that what we'd say? Yeah. So I spoke to Katrin Ulrud, who'd stepped up from Vertu Cycling to Movistar on a two-year contract. Uh, and also to Neve Fisher-Black, who was riding in the UK domestic scene in 2019 and joined our team at the end of 2019 and now is on a two-year contract from 2020. I kicked off the season with a... UCI 1.2 race in New Zealand, New Zealand's only UCI race, oh, well for women anyway, um, and it's called Gravel and Tar, and obviously by its name it's got a fair bit of gravel in it, so I won that so with a big solo effort, so that was a pretty tough way to start the season, that was good, and then next up I had the national championships, which, um, yeah, that, that couldn't have gone better and um, finished off with the hands in the air so that's always pretty good and, and now get a, wear a national jersey for the rest of the year. So last year you were racing in the UK with Torelli? Torelli Ashore, yeah. yeah, yeah, a British team. So what's the, what's the level of support like in a, a typical UK domestic team, if any? Yeah, well, I mean... Obviously, I can't say there was very much support at all, but 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 it got me the races, um, so that's all I cared about really. But um, yeah, compared to, I think when I stepped into Bigler at the end of last year, it was a rather eye opener to to know that the sport can actually be quite a lot different, and going to a race can be a lot easier than. Um, than it would be if you're racing with just a domestic team because obviously the support is just on another level. In terms of the tech that you receive, okay, so tech tra traditionally is your bikes, but actually tech technical support from a team can, in my opinion, encompass so many more things like staff members, soigneurs, masses, um, top teams will have sports psychologists, nutritionists, things like that, access to products. Do you? What do you think for you is the biggest change in terms of any kind of tech support between a domestic and a and a and your professional team, big like a tusha. Um, I'll have to be having mechanics there. Um, uh, yeah, that's just a huge difference. I remember a few races last year. Uh, one in particular, I, the night before the race, I was on the floor of my hotel room changing my bike from a SRAM group set to a Shimano group set. Um, <laughs> uh, Watching YouTube videos, GCN actually, on how to do how to do this, and calling my dad at the same time. But um, we got there, and I got to the race the next day, so that's good. But now with with Bigler, I just have to walk out of my hotel room and down to the bikes, and my bike is there, ready, sparkling clean, and I don't have to worry about a thing. So this year I ride a Chaps Two bike, um, uh, which is a Hero. Uh, with this the climbing bike <laughs> and on the chapter 2 bike we ride uh, Vittoria wheels and Vittoria tyres um, I ride rotor cranks and with that with rotor power meter and obviously a Shimano group set so is the setup different how different is it from your previous setup and did you find it difficult to change bikes from from the bike that you had before to this bike like is it a difficult thing changing pedal systems for instance um or frame sets yeah well yeah it was all a big change and i was lucky enough that i could take a bike home to new zealand and spend the summer uh, getting used to it yeah so i came from a 
S-Works tarmac actually, so slightly different different geometry and it was was quite a lot of getting used to actually. But I really, really like the chapter to Huru now. And in terms of pedals, I definitely had some problems with the speed plays to start with. I um, <laughs> am a smaller rider, so so I had some trouble getting my feet clipped in actually. <laughs> But um, I've worked on it, and and I'm um, I'm getting there now. Still still struggle sometimes, but I'm getting there. <laughs> We're using Canyon and uh, SRAM. And this is what Katrin Ullerud from Movistar had to say about stepping up to the Women's World Tour. I'm actually quite happy. It's a big step from last year, I feel. So, especially the time trial. <laughs> and what did you use last year? Uh, Stork. It's like the road was was good, but the time trial it was shit. <laughs> Just to say it like, and also it's more professional with the uh, movie star because we have like people that know like for the bike fi- fitting for the road bike, but also do like a rare test for the time trial bike, and it's like so much more professional. Um, you get like already so early in the season to get used to the bike and how you should be positioning on the bike. And also for the time trial, of course, like it's really important how you're sitting on the bike, not just like riding the bike, but how area you are, can be. So that's quite happy for. They use a lot of money on us. So you didn't have any problems then going from one bike to another because you, you yeah. had the support? Yeah, because like also when I got a new bike, I didn't feel like I got any problem with my knees or my back or shoulders or anything. Like I felt like it was a smooth, uh, going to the new bike. The good thing part also like we have for the uh, theme is like the bike fitting for the shoes like how the cleats is sitting under the shoes so that's also important when you even if you have the same you I will change uh, shoes like physic so it's also good to get that also supported. For me, before I was just like, oh, I just put uh, the clits under the shoes and then, okay, maybe I feel how it goes <laughs> if I get hurt or if it's okay. <laughs> and maybe sometimes it will be a little bit different. <laughs> I take what I get. <laughs> we get like the same support that the men do now. And it's like so imp- important with nutrition because like it's like the gas for how you <laughs> got to use the bike. And uh, it also like with the mental, like if you're going to work, it's important if you sometimes you actually need to talk with someone and then it's nice to have the option to actually have the access to do it because sometimes even if you don't feel like you need it, it's actually quite nice because you can just uh, let your <laughs> mind uh, open and also sometimes they can help you maybe help you think about situation and maybe, yeah, help you. You don't need to have a problem, but just maybe just to have one there is also nice. To be a good athlete, you actually need most support around and see that you are healthy and ready for fight. <laughs> it's interesting to hear from Neve there, you know, the, the struggles of a, a domestic racer having to change a group set the night before a race. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been in similar situations to like that to Neve all the time when I was racing domestically. You're so often, you know, you've got one bike, you don't have a training bike and a race bike, you've got one bike and, and trying to keep it, trying to keep it in good nick over a British winter is hard. And then you're using it all the time and you've got to make sure it's right for racing and inevitably things go wrong. And when you don't have professionals to help you keep on top of things and you've got the added stress of life, maybe a job, maybe university, traveling to the races, all these other things, it can be really hard and it can be really stressful. So suddenly when you're in that environment, um, you know, like she said, you come down from breakfast, your bike's there, it's sparkling clean, you don't have to worry about a thing. It's just such a big change. I think one of the other interesting things, and it was uh, Catherine that mentioned it, was the um, access to TT equipment. Because obviously, as a domestic pro, you've probably got your road bike, you may have access to uh, a time trial bike, but once you step up to that level where this kit is supplied, the difference between your equipment is night and day, right? And And obviously, this is something that, you know, obviously applies to you because we know how much you concentrate on doing time trials and and improving your time trials yeah definitely i'm really fortunate on my team that i get uh we're supplied with a a time trial bike 
for training at home. And then we have exactly the same setup with a, a racing time trial bike that the team keep. So I know that a lot of teams aren't able for financial reasons or sponsorship reasons or whatever to provide the riders with a training time trial bike. And the way I see it is how the hell can you train properly if you're not able to create that positional adaptation? You know, you're not going to be able to put power out in that position if you can't ride that bike. So yeah, Katrin Ullerud was saying about how in October they go to the camp, they have the fitting and then they do the aero testing because you want to see what position is the fastest. There's no point getting used to a position and then going, oh no, we need to bring you down two centimeters to make you faster because then suddenly you can't put power out. So it's about getting the right balance of power, comfort and speed. And if you're not comfortable, you're not going to be fast. Well, let's hear from um, a couple of men who've also stepped up a level this year. Uh, who did you speak to, Lizzie? Yeah, I spoke to Finn Fisher Black, Neve's brother, who had a pretty flying start to the season. This year, you were, had a really successful campaign at Nationals. You won the under-23 ITT. And in the Elite Roads, I assume you were working for George Bennett, but you still managed to win the sprint from your group to take 10th and win the under-23 jersey. What was that like yeah. to, you know, have a working role and in your first year in under-23, get that jersey and at the same day see your sister take the Elite jersey? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty cool for me, uh, especially after the TT, which was my main focus for myself for the weekend. And um, I knew going into the road race, I was all in for George. And uh, I was, it was um, planning to be George's big day. And uh, I think we almost pulled it off and everyone kind of saw that out there that was watching. So um, it was a pretty close day and I was, I was lucky to just find myself in the selection at the end for under 23. And um with uh, three other guys and it just came down to a sprint just had to empty the rest of the legs out but um yeah it was pretty cool coming across the line and um harry and Neve had won as well and then going home to see the footage and it was a pretty pretty amazing win from her to be honest so uh, yeah yeah that's definitely something that doesn't happen every day it was really cool i was actually yeah. i was actually staying up watching it and uh then like everybody else really? was asleep and i was texting my director like oh my god neve just won and sent him the video it was so yeah. cool so did did you only find out she'd won after you'd finished then yeah so they probably finished uh about an hour before us i'd think and um so yeah i came across the line and um, yeah, I mean, it was a whole load of emotions. It was like, I was absolutely heartbroken for George, but then I was, you know, I had to be happy myself for the U23. And then everyone was coming over and like, yeah, Neve won as well. And I was like, oh, sick. Like, she must have just like run away from them and that. But then I, I go home and watch the finish and it's like a sprint. And I was just like, what? Like, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was pretty cool. In New Zealand for the last probably four years, I've been riding in just this trade team called uh, Team Skoda Frisia, which is just kind of a domestic trade team um, that supports junior riders in New Zealand, really. And then I came over to Europe and did uh, half a season with uh, Villebrod, um, a Dutch junior team. And uh, they kind of supported me while I was here. And I mean, um, as far as under-19 teams go, that's they were kind of like as good as it gets in terms of um, support compared to under 23 and the Yamba Visma Academy. It's just a, it's another step up. So it's pretty fortunate to be where I am now, I guess, with all the sports. So yeah, we're pretty lucky actually. We it's Everything's pretty much the same as the World Tour team. Um, obviously without as many luxuries, of course, but um, we run the same bikes, uh, same, all the equipment's the same. Uh, there's a few different sponsors on the kit. But, um, yeah, in terms of what we get, it's, we're pretty fortunate. It's quite a lot of it. I've just received all my all my bags of kit today, so just sorting through it. And it's kind of just Christmas came again, so, yeah. On the road bikes, we run the Bianchi Ultra XR4s. Um, in the development team, we all run disc brakes, um, and it's all equipped with Jurass Di2, Jurass wheels, um, Jurass power meters, it's all very Shimano based. For the TT bike, we run a, a, a coil, I think it's said. Um, they're pretty quick. I've ridden that for the past year because um, 
I was Yambo gave me a bit of support last year, set me up on the bike. So I rode the TT bike for last year as well. So I'm pretty used to that now. But um, that's all equipped with your SDI tour as well. And then we have a few different discs for different types of courses. So we run the uh, Pro Shimano disc, which is um, a bit more aero. And then we've also got the Vision disc as well. So yeah. I think it already started as maybe a junior where it got a little bit more professional and then uh, yeah, I was Conti for one year and then Pro Conti now for two years before moving up to the World Tour. My name is Mikael Björk, I ride for UAE Team Emirates. In a way, it, it was just a small step every year, and uh, but still now at the, at the World Tour, it's, uh, yeah, the, the difference is, is, uh, is, is very big for sure, because everything has to be monitored and uh, because people invest a lot of money and time in, in the project, then they also want to see results and yeah, and they want to make sure that the riders pre perform in yeah, the best possible way. I think the change was uh, pretty pretty similar, or it was easy to, to translate one position uh, from one bike to another. Um, but I think for sure the biggest, uh, not issue, but the biggest challenge was uh, finding the right saddle because the measurements is pretty easy to, to get spot on. But when you change saddle sponsors, it can sometimes be not tricky, I would say, but uh, you maybe have to go through, uh, yeah, two or three saddles before you find the one that, that you're really comfortable on. And that's for sure something that was not always provided when you were uh, yeah, even a junior or a continental uh, level rider. Even you just get given one saddle and you have to ride with it, or maybe you only have one and, and yeah, can only afford one saddle. I ride now, uh, ride on a Colnago. Um, it's called the K1. Uh, I believe the time trial bike um, with uh, Campanolo Super Record, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, group set and uh, yeah, Campanolo wheels and uh, Pro Logo saddle. Um, I think obviously when you sign the contract and everything is uh, very nice and you think fuck it, everything is possible and you see really young guys already performing really early, guys like Remco and uh, yeah, Bernal and. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, whatnot. But uh, and then starting to race a little bit uh, in the World Tour field. I did um, Tour Down Under in Australia here in uh, January, and then just finished off El, El Gabi yesterday. And uh, yeah, I, I got my ass kicked a little bit on the time trial. So for sure, it's it's a transition that uh, that also mentally you need to prepare for to uh, suffer a little bit more than uh, you're maybe used to in on the twenty threes. You're one of the very rare people that's gone from disc to rim. How did you find that? Yeah. Uh, the transition actually uh, was l like, I think going from disc, or oh, sorry, from rim to disc, that really feels like, whoa, I can really stop now. Like, uh, it's almost uh, mentally, it's, uh, it's bigger. Because then when you change back to rim brake, it's like, okay, this is actually more or less the same so i don't know what the fuss was about before actually so so actually i would say that the change is not so big but i think also maybe it depends on which yeah which wheels you have and uh, which um yeah what's it called brake uh, pads you have i changed um pedal system from uh, speedplay to uh, luke uh, keo and i think always when you change systems uh, yeah it i think it's within like all systems if you change then uh, try it out one day and then don't do a six hour ride the first day you change shoes or change pedals because then you can really uh, yeah you can really get in trouble i think um, so maybe change and yeah that was what i did just change and then do maybe one hour easy and then feels like see if it feels normal or if it feels strange because then something is usually wrong if it doesn't feel right the Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thanks, as always, to Science in Sport for their continued sponsorship of the Cycling Podcast and all that we do here. If you want to get 25% off your next order with Science in Sport, then simply go to the website and enter the offer code SISCP25. That's SISCP25. I think one of the things that I took from that and that 
I don't know if it surprised me, but when Finn was talking about um, the setup at the Jumbo Visma under 23, it was effectively the same as a world tour team and much better than most women's teams, dare I say it. Yeah, I mean, you're completely right. I would say the, the setup in the under 23 development team is about the same as the very top women's world tour teams. Um, the level of support and the level of detail that's provided to every aspect of a rider's training, health, lifestyle, racing, it's just insane. You know, it's not that common in the women's peloton. Obviously, Katrin Ullerud was telling us about how it is like this in Movistar. The women are treated the same as the men. They get the same resources. And hopefully that the women's world tour system will will push push the teams to, to make this more common and more the norm um but we're definitely not there yet so it it's really quite crazy to hear what you know an 18 year old on a u23 development team receives in terms of support what was it like i mean you've changed teams i mean so going from your amateur days you did a bit of time with story and then you were with united healthcare over in the states and now with big look Katusha. What were those jumps like for you bet- between the teams? And, and and was it difficult for you getting used to new equipment? Yeah, and even in the domestic level, you know, I stepped up a few times. So each time it's been a step up and each time you kind of go, oh, wow, you know, I didn't realise it could be this easy. I didn't realise this support could make such, make such a difference. I have changed bikes a lot. Um, I think I've had maybe five or six different bikes and um, it can be hard to switch over, but... As long as, like Mikael said about when you're you're changing cleats uh, and pedal systems, you don't get on a new bike and go and smash out a really hard four hour ride. You get on a new bike, you get on the new shoes, you get on the new pedals and you ride easy. You wait till it feels a bit better. You might even go back to the old set of pedals and shoes for a couple of rides if you're not quite sure if you want to do a hard training session or something and then you steadily increase it the best time to do it is off season or um, if you're an amateur just when when things are a bit lighter Um, and it enables your body to slowly adapt um, and then yet you have that positional adaptation and then you get used to it and then you don't get an injury it's when you go bam straight in um, that's when you get the problems Mikel also spoke there about uh, swapping between rim brakes and disc brakes. Um, have you ever had to do that that jump at all, Izzy? No, I've never used disc brakes, but I think it was really eye-opening that he said, yeah, when you swap back to rim, the difference isn't as much as you think. And perhaps we need more people on the peloton saying this because you always get the opposite. You've always got the people who are going from rim to, to disc and they're publicising and they're saying we should have just disc in the peloton. Um, It's so dangerous to have a mix. And then actually you've got Mikael saying, well, the difference really isn't as big as you think it is. Um, And perhaps it's more of a psychological difference. So I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. And perhaps that's a, a voice that needs to be heard a little bit more. Well, it's interesting because it all comes down to, to marketing, doesn't it? And we're going to go back now to Jonathan Guerin, uh, Global Director of Sports Marketing at Cannondale. Um, we heard from him earlier on talking about the uh, three women's teams that they are supporting this year. Um, but when I speak to him, I always wonder what kind of actual influence sponsoring or supplying bikes to a professional team actually has on bike sales. A major component of investment in any sports marketing property within the bicycle industry for me and for our brand, right, is that the validation and the product and proof of product performance that our elite level athletes give um, is an inspiration and has a halo effect on the purchase decision of, of a consumer walking into a shop or watching that sport on TV. What I will say, though, is that that influence 10 years ago versus today is probably not as heavily weighted to to an elite athlete making the decision for a consumer versus today. There are so many other areas of influence. Um, it's peer influence is a big component. Um, media reviews and independent reviews of product performance and product feel are really important social media and your peer groups and what they're riding and their experience with bikes and what you're going to do with your equipment have a major impact on the decision. And then in that component, as we understand the purchase path, right, that component for a large majority comes down to 
what are the professionals using and are those professionals athletes that I admire and aspire to be like, um, and then through their performance, prove the product's capabilities for me through their racing. Um, Lizzie, is, with, with your sponsors, is everything about what you do on the bike in races, or are you now under more pressure to sort of be influential on, on social media or to, to do other exploits on the bike, you know, like do alternative races and alternative challenges and things like that? With the partners on, that we have on Big Look Atusha, I would say not at all. They're completely supportive of just trying to make uh, our environment the best it can be to enable us to, to race and train the best we can. Um, they don't push you to to post on social media or, you know, um, do crazy other adventures. I'm definitely <laughs> the kind of person who likes to do cr- other crazy other adventures. Yeah. Um and if there was a gravel race going, I'd probably be up for it. Um, but no, it's it's a really nice, really nice setup. Actually, they just want to they want to help get the best out of us that they can. They want to support the development of women's cycling. And I would say this is across the board for all of our partners. Um, and yeah, they're just really supportive of what they do and they want us to help them make the products better. Well, this is the last bit we're going to hear from Jonathan. Um, he talks to me about the changing nature of what riders actually want from a bike sponsor. I don't talk to a program, men, women, um, discipline agnostic here, where they don't ask about other bikes to do other events. So if I'm talking to a road team, a women's road team, they all ask me about how do I also supply cyclocross and gravel bikes for my riders. Five years ago, that was never a question, right? It was never like it was never a question about listen what material we would supply in a contract was only specific to the road. Today we have to think much more expansive about what we supply to the team because for sure they're all thinking about how to mix up training, mix up their riding, be better cyclists by doing multi disciplines, even if it's just in training. I've seen your bikes. You, you've got. Uh, I've been out riding with you. You've got the time trial bike. You've got the road bike. You haven't got the gravel bike or the mountain bike. I don't think. I don't think chapter two do those just yet. No, but cha- it's chapter different... two. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. You're completely oh, do they? mistaken. Oh, sorry. Have chapter I got it wrong? Chapter two have an incredible gravel bike called the AO, and it's really cool. You can do. Have you got one? I don't have one. So chapter two, if you're listening, feel free to send me one. <laughs> I would love to razz it around the Peak District. Um, no, it's a really cool bike. You can, you know, you can stack it with panniers for kind of long touring adventures. You can, it's got really wide clearance. You take it off road and you take it, well, anywhere. You can do pretty much anything you could do on a mountain bike on it. Um, but no, I don't have a gravel bike or a mountain bike. I tend to just go on some pretty rogue routes on my road bike. Um, yeah. And maybe I pushed the road bike a little bit too far out of its comfort zone. <laughs> but um, no, I, I understand why riders want more. I think it's a really good way to keep your training fresh, keep your mind fresh. You know, when you're just doing the same thing over and again on the road, um, it can be very repetitive. And as soon as you go off a path that's you know a few meters away from the road you usually ride, you suddenly see a completely different view, even though it's the view that you've seen every day, but it's a tiny different angle and you appreciate the surroundings so much more and it just refreshes you and makes you fall in love with cycling again, makes you remember why you loved it in the first place and you just want to do more and more of that. I basically need to get out of the shed, don't I? Um, I'm wondering if you've seen this with other riders, though. Like, you know, riders um, changing their training, so they they are having you know, they want these different bikes from their suppliers just to keep their training interesting uh, and fresh, I guess. Yeah, I definitely have seen a trend with um, in the female peloton, at least, more professionals going out on the mountain bike and trying to keep it fresh i think it's a great way to to increase your skills develop your cornering abilities develop your confidence as well well that's it for this month uh lizzie hopefully for next month's show uh we can actually get together hopefully i'll be be able to venture outside i'll be back on the road don't worry tom i can always cycle over snake pass twice so that you don't have to (laughs) I don't think I don't think even you, as hardcore as you are, would have fancied it today at all. I wouldn't say um, I fancied the, it. I, mean, I wouldn't say I fancied it, but I would have got it done. <laughs> 
Um, so, uh, between now and the next episode, uh, where are people going to see you, Lizzie? Where, where are you off to? I know you're off to Belgium later today or tomorrow. Yeah, Omloop Pet Newsblad and Hagland this weekend, then over to Strada, um, then back to Drenthe in the Netherlands the following weekend. And if it's not cancelled due to coronavirus, then uh, back to Trofeo Binder in, uh, in Italy, north of Milan. Well, good luck for all of that, and uh, I'll see you next month. Thanks, Tom. This episode of Service Course was produced by me. Our theme music is Beyond the Black Veil by the brilliant Moscow Youth Court. Do go and check them out. Additional music also comes from Moscow Youth Court's John Dix. Thanks as ever, John. And the rest of the tracks in the show come via Epidemic Sound. For details of the individual tracks, then please check the show notes. Thanks again. Thanks again.